Shalom Sadiqim. There's a topic I want to talk about before I forget. I've been meaning for a long time to bring it up. Uh, so, if you haven't noticed, <laughs> I don't call myself a Christian. I do not believe that the New Testament is uh, infallible or that it is equal to the Hebrew Scriptures definitely not equal to the Torah, the Law of Moses, that in the Jewish faith we believe was given uh, by God through Moses. Uh, Christians do agree with that, but I don't hold the New Testament equal to the Law of Moses. That does not mean, though, that I do not value the New Testament or that I think that the New Testament is evil or that I think it uh, doesn't contain uh, a great deal of truth. To the contrary, I do believe it contains a great deal of truth. Um, and the mere fact that a text may have some textual corruption doesn't mean that it's completely um, unreliable. Most of the textual corruption in the New Testament are documented at the bottom of the pages of most English translations that you can find just about anywhere. And the relatively small number of corruptions that are not documented there are pretty understood in the text if a person is uh, familiar with first century history. All that said, um, so while I do not call myself a Christian, I do not demonize Christians, I consider Christians for the most part to be my brothers in the faith of the God of Israel, even if we have some theological disagreements there are theological disagreements even among Christians. There are theological and Christological differences even between different types of Orthodox and Catholic Christians, not just between Catholics and Protestants. So I don't think that such theological differences should be a uh, matter which creates hostility or anger or rudeness or condemnation among people in their everyday interactions. I don't think that that's the will of God, nor as somebody who values the words of Jesus, nor do I think that that is uh, his will either. That doesn't mean that you can't have discussions, respectful, honest, and, and intellectual discussions, and two intellectual people, two equally sincere people, can still come to disagreements. That's not a contradiction. Very often, the more intelligent people are, the more different angles they're able to see things and the more factors they're able to take into consideration, and we do not all know the same thing. All this to say, um, I have been asked on more than one occasion if I value the New Testament and if I believe that many of the words of Jesus have been misunderstood inadvertently, not out of ill intent, but many of the words of Jesus have been misunderstood simply because people are not aware of the cultural and literary context in which Jesus taught and lived, um, then what do I make of passages such as where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man came to the Father but by me. This video is not meant to be exhaustive. I'm just going to try to give a short uh relatively short answer to that question just to give you an idea and maybe on another occasion I will be able to give a more lengthy explanation. So in short, it's believed that the Gospels as we have them in the current uh, codified form of the New Testament, that these Gospels originated from some underlying text or tradition of Jesus' uh, sayings. And if we look at other um, non-canonical writings of, this, of the Gospels of, of Jesus, there are other Gospels which I don't believe are as authoritative or reliable as the standard Gospels, but that doesn't mean that they have nothing to come to teach us. There's something we can learn from them. So those other Gospels often are in a more... Uh, and are often in a form more akin to like the book of Proverbs, where you just have the sayings of Jesus, uh, as opposed to the standard New Testament Gospels, where the saying of, sayings of Jesus are embedded in a narrative, so that the bulk of the Gospels in the standard New Testament 
the bulk of those gospels are not his actual sayings or, or uh, teachings, but are narratives trying to give a context to his words. You can buy what's called a red letter Bible where it intends to highlight all the words of Jesus and flip through that version of the New Testament and you'll see that the majority of the New Testament, um, it, well, not just the New Testament, the Gospels are not his words, uh, though obviously a great deal are. That said, I think it is possible that when Jesus originally said, I am the way and the truth and the life, given the benefit of the doubt to the New Testament, to the Gospels as we have it today, that he actually said this, I think that more than likely when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me, I believe he was speaking as a personification of the Word of God. Hearkening back, for example, to John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says that he is, I'm paraphrasing, that in the beginning was the word or message. Uh, the word logos can be translated multiple ways. And it was made flesh, it dwelt among us, and basically that's Jesus, okay? So I believe that Jesus, when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me, he's speaking in the context of presenting himself as a personification of the word of God. And um, as such... Just as we see in the Hebrew Bible, in the Law of Moses, uh, in the Book of Proverbs, in the Book of Psalms, we see that the Word of God is the Torah, that is, the Law of Moses. Um, and the Law of Moses, the, the Torah, it's called the Word of God, again and again, including in the New Testament. So, Torah, by the way, doesn't actually mean law, though that's the most common way people translate it. It means guidance. Or instruction. Uh, so, God's word is instruction, and God's instruction, God's guidance is his word. All right? So, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, again and again, the word of God, the Torah, is called the life. It is called the truth. And it is repeatedly emphasized as the way in which one serves God. I believe in that literary context and that literary background which Jews educated Jews in the first century were aware of so they understood that context in that context the Torah is the way the truth and the life the Word of God is the way the truth and the life and you cannot come to the Father you cannot have a relationship with God if you turn your turn away from his word if you just ignore his guidance. Um, an example is in Proverbs chapter 8 where it has the wisdom of God personified. All right, So the wisdom of God speaks in, in a figurative sense in Proverbs chapter 8 and it says there that uh, the person who finds wisdom finds life and that the one who wants to please the Lord the one who wants to please God embraces wisdom. All right? So that wisdom is the way to please God and wisdom is the life. Um, furthermore, you have also in the book of Proverbs where it says the one who turns his ear away from hearing the Torah, the word of God, even his prayer is an abomination. So, if you turn your ear away from hearing the Torah and that makes your prayer an abomination, that would mean that you cannot have a, uh, you cannot approach God, you cannot approach our Heavenly Father unless you heed the Torah. So if your prayer is not accepted if you turn away from the Torah, the, the reverse of that is implied in the text that one who turns his ear to heed the Torah, his prayer is accepted by God. Um, so, I believe that when Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me, he is speaking as a personification of the Torah, the Word of God, which, as Jewish tradition has always taught, we cannot have a proper relationship with God uh, unless we have that relationship with him 
by going through his Torah, his guidance, his word. An addendum to this is that the Torah, the word of God, throughout the book of Leviticus makes distinctions between high-handed sin and inadvertent sin. So, the word of God is not revealed to everyone equally and it is not an all or nothing thing. Yes, if you know consciously that something is the word of God and you reject it, that is rebellion. You do not embrace the word of God. But the word of God, the Torah, God's guidance, is revealed to people to different degrees, to different levels. The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, did not have the entire Torah. They did not have the entire guidance of God uh, as established in the Torah and given for all humanity. But they embraced the Torah, they embraced God's word as it was revealed to them. And I believe... Sorry, something came up. I believe that this is the answer to the idea of what happens to people who never heard of Christ or what happens to people who never heard, uh, never received the Bible or never heard of Torah. Is God going to condemn them to hell forever? I think that's absurd and it flies in the face of the nature of God that we see in, in the Word of God and in the Bible. I think that God judges each person according to the level of knowledge that they have and according to the desire that they had to seek out truth and the humility that they had to receive it when they understood it. And that is different for every person. That doesn't mean that there's a hundred different religions and a hundred different truths, but we are all at different places. Uh, so, the book of Leviticus, which is a part of the Word of God, is a part of the Torah, makes a distinction between high-handed sin, inadvertent sin, uh, a sin that a person does by error, is fundamentally, in essence, different from a high-handed sin where a person violates the Word of God knowingly and high-handedly. Those are apples and oranges, so to speak. They're completely different things. So a person who does not embrace a certain commandment of God because they just don't know about it or because they're, they're uninformed and they've been misled and they think that some aspect of God's law is actually... Uh, a heresy that that has crept in not because they're intending to do evil but because they're just ignorant I don't think these people are condemned to hell I think they're simply mistaken they may lose out on some blessings of God in this life or in the world to come if they don't make the investment or the sacrifice to educate themselves a little bit but if that person embraces God's word God's guidance to the extent that they understand, and they are not consciously, high-handedly rejecting the Word of God, I don't believe that we can apply to them that they are turning their ear away from God's Word. Uh, if they embrace it to the degree that they are capable. Um, that said, we should all strive to uh, be as intellectually honest with ourselves and others as we are capable, and we should all seek God's will in this world and I think that the best principle one can have wherever they are in life is that if if we would say that God is the ultimate reality or ultimate estab ultimate foundation upon which all reality is based then uh, and everything is based on it then uh, if God is the ultimate decider or establisher of truth and reality, I think it follows that re that truth is consistent and that the uh, opposite of truth, falsehood, is inconsistent. So a good guide to begin with in seeking God and seeking his word, whatever that may be, or to determine what it may not be, is to see how consistent a concept or a teaching is. How consistent is that teaching with itself? How consistent is that teaching with uh, the Bible, with archaeology, with other witnesses, other historical witnesses? And when seeking whether or not something is consistent with the Bible, if that is your concern, 
you have to be consistent with the underlying original language of the Bible. Make sure you're not basing it on some translation that was made just a hundred years ago or 50 years ago. Make sure that the translators uh, were not biased. I cannot encourage you enough to educate yourself to the extent that you're able. Uh, educate yourself in the biblical languages if you value the Bible. If you believe that the Bible is the Word of God, whether only the Hebrew Bible or whether the New Testament or both, make some time to study the underlying original languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, if you're talking about the Greek New Testament. Um, <clears throat> it is not an, un, an all or nothing endeavor. That's a, a, a an error. That's a mistake. You would not avoid going into a new field or occupation unless uh, you're going to be the absolute best and automatically know everything. That's an irrational approach to life and it doesn't work. It's not consistent. We all have to start somewhere and a little bit of knowledge regarding the underlying languages of the Bible is better than no knowledge. So as long as we're moving forward, we're intellectually honest with ourselves and with others and with God, I think that we are going in the way of truth and of life and I think that that is the path to God's Word. And it is, perhaps, you could say, the most elemental aspect of it. Integrity, honesty. As it says in the book of Micah, uh, you have been told, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord seeks from you, desires from you, requires of you. And that is that you act justly, you do acts of justice, you, you are fair, you love compassion, you love doing acts of compassion, and you walk humbly, modestly with your God. That is the quintessential aspect of serving God and being good to your fellow man. On that note, yes, I believe that Jesus speaking as a personification of the Word of God, that it is true when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. But whether that means a person has to uh, embrace a certain image of Jesus or know that he even existed um, in order to serve God, that I do not believe whatsoever, and I don't think that was his intention. Uh, so, 20 minutes, a short little be uh, intro to this topic. <laughs> told you I'd keep it brief on that note all the best leave comments down below up above wherever they are and let me know your thoughts or any questions you have all the best Shalom Uvracha Yalla bye